morning lecture 3, we are going to focus on plot in cinema, in plot in films. So, these are the key concepts that I will be discussing today. What is narrative? Okay, and then I am going to talk about elements of narrative, how a plot is unplotted. So, narrative, levels of narrative, diegetic, intradiegetic uh, elements, theories of narrative, and certain uh, cinematic and literary concepts the, like defamiliarization and the concept of the unreliable narrator. Um, these are the key theories we should be uh, looking at, but uh, uh, this is not an exhaustive list. We will be uh, dealing with more theories um, as we go deeper into the course. So, one is Gerard Genet, a French theorist who is a formidable influence on a, a narrative. All these uh, um, theories basically they focus on literary theories, but then we are going to see how literary theories can be applied to cinematic theories as well. Roland Barth, Victor Shklovsky and Vladimir Propp. So, these are our theories that we will be looking in detail today. Uh, so, what is a plot? A plot can be, you know, it, a, a cinematic plot or a filmic, or sorry, or a literary plot. Okay, where is the plot? People are often ask, what does it mean? So, it could be even verbal, written, or visual, as in cinema. Even a painting can have a plot. Even a painting, can, a, a photograph can tell you a story. There is a plot over there. Perhaps you are some of you who are interested in photography would know uh, the art of or the uh, uh, there is a field called concept photography. You develop a concept and there is a plot there is not merely a portrait or a picture there is a concept there. Okay. So, narrative is the way a story is told. So, the joke is um, mothers no longer tell their children or children no longer tell their mothers rather that tell me a story, it's tell me a narrative, <laughs> the, the way a story is told. Film combines all these com elements and therefore, becomes a complex, complex activity. Now, now, see I have to tell you something and please do remember it, plot comes out of the story. It is a casual sequence of the chronological events in a story. I would like to direct your attention to E. M. Foster's aspects of the novel to understand story and plot better. For instance, Foster gives us a story as the king died and the queen died, that is a story. But when you say the king died and the queen died of grief, that becomes a plot. Now, um, most stories, most cinematic, most literary theories and this is a very universal concept I am talking about. They deal with human and universal experiences, unless you are talking about matrix, which is of course, about human experiences, but of a very different kind. Okay. So, um, this is what we uh, most of us face, uh, birth, growth going on adventure, go, adventure could be go, going uh, about with our day to day life. So, that is adventurous enough, facing various temptations. Give me example, I mean here of course, we are talking about narratives, but what could be a narrative temptation, temptation in a narrative. A hero is born he grows, he goes on a particular adventure, he faces temptation, he may win, he may lose. If he wins, it is a happy ending, if he loses, it is a tragedy. Okay. Uh, he may fall in or out of love, that is part of the adventure. Li lastly, 
life lessons derived. Okay, so, all of us when we uh, take stock of our life, there are certain life lessons. At the end of these five years in IIT, there will be certain life lessons, okay. hopefully pleasant for most of us. Now, um, let me give you an example. How many of you are familiar with the story of Oedipus? Yes. Can you apply Oedipus to this? Yes, Shweta. Just tell me birth and growth. Okay, so, Oedipus is born hmm? in um, the palace to the king and the queen and there is a prophecy which says that he will grow up to kill his father and sleep with his mother. Yes. So, uh, as he becomes a toddler, they, the, his mother puts him in a basket and sends him out to be to be left in a field to die. Yeah. But he is take, taken in by a shepherd's man and he grows up in a different kingdom adopted by a neighboring king. Yes. And, um, Fine. Now, Tara, if you are familiar with the story, going on adventure, uh, let me tell you and you have to help me here. Um, Oedipus, as she rightly pointed out, grows up um, in the household of a neighboring king, uh, unaware completely that he, his real parents are uh, some, some, uh, some other people. Now, there in that other kingdom, there is another prophecy and he is told by the oracle there that uh, um, you will end up marrying your mother and killing your father. Now, that prompts him to go on an adventure. He escapes from that kingdom in order to avoid this horrible fate and goes on an adventure. Now, what is that adventure? Things happen to him. Yeah, and then eventually it leads that uh, he gets into a war, he unknowingly joins the army which is in a war uh, with the uh, his Original father, yeah, and uh, unwittingly, and he kill, kills him. unwittingly. So that's going on adventure. Thank you. Facing temptations, yes, uh, perhaps not to that extent in Oedipus, but in many um, uh, films and many stories, you will find. We will be talking about that. Our own Indian epics they trace these things. Elements of temptations. Our heroes are in exile. They face various temptations. Okay, winning, losing and then life lessons derived. It is a standard plot. This is the way most plots unfold. Now, please do remember, plot comes out of the story. It is a casual sequence of the chronological events in a story. I would like to direct your attention to E. M. Foster's aspects of the novel to understand story and plot better. For instance, Foster gives us a story as the king died and the queen died. That is a story. But when you say the king died and the queen died of grief, that becomes a plot. I am showing you a still from this very popular movie, no prizes for guessing. What is this movie? Terminator, Terminator 2, the judgment mm -hmm. day. Now, can you apply all these? I will give you a minute. Can you apply all these elements that we have just discussed to this movie? You have to also tell me whose journey it is. Apply the features we just talked about. Srinath, can you start? Can you give us some inputs here? Okay, it is a boy's journey. Movie is seen through the point of view. So, point of view is a very important concept in any narrative. Okay, how a story is focalized. So, that is another concept that you should be familiar with. Focalization, point of view, perspectives, all these terms are given to us by Gerard Janet. Okay. Now, um, Vedant, if we apply birth, growth, adventure, do you think John Bonner's story make, makes sense? Do all these things fit? Since 
<coughs> by the robot. By the robot. Yeah. yeah. It is a phenomenal story. Yeah. It is an epic story in uh, which uh, the original story was in two parts the way I remember and then after that also we had a couple of sequels to it. But the story begins and uh, uh, unfolds and ends in part 1 and part 2 the way we understood the, the terminator we popularly refer to. So, um, this is the story and there is the hero going on for an adventure, okay. how he meets someone who becomes his mentor, a father figure okay, and life lessons learnt. So, he there is a growth in the boy's character, the robo, yes, the robo remains robo, but also there is a there are certain changes in the robo as well. He imbibes more human or human humane qualities, but in the boy there is a complete growth in the character of the boy. He finds him, uh, John Connor and his friend are robbing an ATM or something. Exactly. And it is after that this scene is when they are being chased by the other, the yes. T8 and TX whatever. Yes. So, the, yeah, so the facing temptations in the sense that he is living with his foster parents yes. and how he is rebelling, he is at that particular age. Yeah. So, he is rebelling against the establishment. Also the that. fact that he comes from a disturbed family, yeah. absolute absence of, father, of, of his real father. His foster parents are shown to be quite indifferent to him. Okay. And then he also has this uh, major problem where uh, the mother is uh, confined to an asylum. So, all these problems, so it is also a coming of age film, the kind of genre I keep talking about, the Bildungs Roma. Okay. So, boy's journey, good. Now, Gerard Janet in his uh, seminal text, Narrative Discourse, 1983, um, he tells us what are the components, basic elements of a story or the contents, and he tells us about events, the chronology. Of course, you know when you look at a movie like Pulp Fiction, there is a total disruption of chronology, but that is a that is an exceptional movie that we that also we will go, we are going to talk about later. Uh, causality. Now, all events should have um, a cause effect relationship. Okay. This happen A B happened because A happened. There should be a proper and appropriate link. Okay. So, Janet also talks about causality, importance of causality and effect in a story. Characters, their actions and their interactions with each other or with one another and how these impact, how they lead how, uh, to a coherent plot. Janet also talks about setting, the importance of setting in a plot, spatio temporal complexes by which we mean uh, where it is set, uh, spaces, temporal, what time it is set in. Janet has given us three categories of time, of narrative time called order, duration, frequency. By order, we, we mean in which order the plot is unfolded. We also have flashbacks, flash forwards in narrative, remember, no, right. So, uh, flashbacks and flash forwards that contribute towards making of order, the order how sequences unfold. In pulp fiction, for example, the, uh, the entire concept of order is disrupted. Okay. Duration for how long does a particular scene last on screen, this duration. Frequency, the number of times a scene is repeated or an action is repeated, that is frequency. Okay. So, duration in other words suggests the speed of narration of time and is understood through the amount of text. In cinematic terms, we can say uh, the amount of time is spent on screen and devoted to the narration of a stretch of a story time. Frequency is the relation between an episode in the story and the number of times it is narrated. So, in the narrative of Kurosawa's Rashomon 1950 movie, a particular event is repeated several times. 
how many of you are familiar with Rashomon? Okay, if you are not, then please watch it because that's a movie that will be uh, discussed frequently in this course. So Gerard's concepts of order, uh, duration, and frequency. So, this is a still from Gone with the Wind. Here, spaces and time are two elements which are very well defined, very clearly articulated. What are the spaces? What is the setting? Uh, that is the time. Okay, space. The south. The south. Yeah, the plantation period. Yeah, the plantations. Um, Alabama, Atlanta, those are the spaces that a movie is looking at. In particular, Tara, the heroine's Scarlett O'Hara's mention, that is a very important setting, space. Temporal, the civil war period, 1861 to 65, and the aftermath. Okay, so, very clearly defined. I am just trying to draw your attention to how narratives are done in films. So, here space and time are clearly dis defined. And what is your opinion on spaces and time in the matrix? Do we have a very clear indication of spaces and time? But this is also one way of, because it's, it belongs to a totally different genre, the science fiction. Movies like Gone with the Wind belong to a different category linear storytelling, classic Hollywood, classic storytelling. Science fiction can play around with these elements. Okay. So, science fiction has uh, you know a grammar of its own. Any comments, any uh, questions here? Yes. You are talking about Andy Warhol's. Yeah. See, Andy Warhol is an avant gardist. Okay. He is not really interested in uh, uh, telling you a story, okay. but he is trying to capture a particular moment in our society. So, he is a pop culturist. He wants to look at the mundane aspects of life. So, uh, his various projects. I mean, look at his, even his um, photographs, Marilyn Monroe, Elizabeth Taylor, same picture, but um, with, uh, tinged with a different color palette. It tells you about stardom. Marilyn is Mar Marilyn, no matter where. Okay, so, that is stardom for you. Elizabeth Taylor remains Elizabeth Taylor. Now, uh, what he is trying to capture in those famous documentaries is the idea of monotony of the contemporary world. So, that is war all. So, there is not a story being told, but in films like Gone with the Wind, Citizen Kane, Matrix, there is a story, there is a plot. In war all, we do not have plots. Yeah. So, Janet also talks about um, kinds of characters. A narrator could be reliable or unreliable. We are going to look at that. This is a very interesting area, the reliable in a narrator, the unreliable narrator. We also look at levels of narration, story within story, embedded narrations, multiple narrations. We also look at the narrative voice. Who is the narrator? Now, I will explain. Reliable and unreliable narrators, levels of narrators, narratology, and the voice in a narrative. Narration in films are of three categories. One could be extra diegetic. These are the terms you should be familiar with extra diegetic, it is 
a kind of a voice over, I am sure you know what is a voice over in cinema. So, the voice does not necessarily belong to any character from the movie itself. For example, in Billy Wilder's The Apartment, there is a voice, there is a voice over, but it's, the voice does not belong to anyone from the movie, from the film. Homodiegetic, the voice over is the voice of a person or narrator who is a character in the film. Intradiegetic is when characters start speaking to each other to further the plot or to further reveal them, uh, themselves. They tell us a lot about themselves by their conversation with each other and I will give you examples from each category. So, extra diegetic we have already seen the apartment where the character the voice over does not belong to any of the characters. Remember these terms. American beauty for example, plays on the homodiegetic narration. There is a voice over, okay. from within a year I am going to die, right. Yeah, this is me and this is my house, that is the way and the, we know that Kevin Spacey is talking to us. Kevin Spacey somehow finds his way very often in this course and it will keep on happening. I was just giving it a thought <laughs> okay. and we were talking about Kevin Spacey yesterday with reference to 7 and then I thought oh my god the number of films that I have in mind with star Kevin Spacey. So, uh, interesting actor and very interesting body of work. Uh, Sunset Boulevard, if you have watched the movie with uh, it is again a Billy, Ward, um, Billy Wilder movie and we are told the hero is already dead, but the dead body the voice over belongs to the dead body the dead hero. Okay. My story begins one year ago, do you know the movie? No, Sunset Boulevard, Billy Wilder's movie please make a note of it, belongs to the um, classic Hollywood period. We will be talking about classic Hollywood soon. So, uh, Days of Heaven, one of the earlier movies um, of Richard Gere, a very young Richard Gere, directed by Terence Malick. I think it was his first major feature, and again, it has a very interesting voiceover. The voice does not belong to the hero or the heroine or even to the parallel hero, but to the hero's younger sister. The hero is dead, we are told at the beginning. The voice over, the narrator is the hero's sister. Again, examples of homodiegetic narration, Hitchcock's Rebecca. Last night I dreamt I went to Mandalay again, okay, based on Daphne du Maurier's novel. That is the way the novel begins, that is the way the film begins. Watch Rebecca. Spider Man, does it have any voiceover? With great power comes great responsibility. Who does he say this to? Earlier on in the movie, his uncle says these very wise words. Okay, uncle telling these words of wisdom to Peter Parker. At the end of the movie, we hear Peter Parker saying, uh, repeating the same words. Who is he talking to? To us, okay, to us and not to Mary Jane in particular. He is talking to us and it is his voice, the voice over narration. So, pay attention to these elements, you will enjoy films more. Any example, anything else that comes to your mind? Fight Club, Titanic. Titanic. Okay, all examples of which kind of na homo diegetic. And what is homo diegetic narrator? Narrative, the character, the ca who belongs to the movie, his or her voice. Could be a minor, could be a major character. And let me give you a very example. Uh, 
a very interesting example in this uh, category is a movie called About a Boy. Familiar with the title? About a boy, Hugh Grants. Yeah. Now, see, th there is something very interesting happening in About a Boy. It is a very short, very sweet movie, but it has two voiceovers, two narrators, at times contradicting it and other times at uh, complementing each other. So, the little boy who uh, Hugh Grant is a uh, father figure to, and then occasionally who grants voice. So, we have two voiceovers giving us narration. Okay. So, very interesting movie in terms of plot and narrative. Intra diegetic characters speaking to each other and revealing something about themselves for the audience's benefit. We learn a lot about the plot and the characters. Now, here uh, we have Tom Hanks in conversation with a lady on the bench. We re, do you remember there was a, a, you know when we were doing semiotics, we looked at this particular still from Forrest Gump. That is the point when Tom uh, uh, Hanks character, he is sitting alone on a bench. Later on, he is joined by a lady and then he starts talking to her and then he reveals. So, for, for, um, Forrest Gump is full of homo diegetic as well as intra diegetic narrations. My mama told me, can we, life is a box of chocolates. Okay, watch the movie, we will be discussing it later on. And then narration playing on with the concept of multiple perceptions. Again, I go back to Rashomon Kurosawa's Please watch it and then we will be talking about it in greater depth later on. Uh, again, Janet's concept of unreliable narrator. Uh, unreliable narrator, his function is to reveal an interesting gap between appearance and reality and to show how human beings distort or conceal the latter. several uh, instances of unreliable narrator in especially in contemporary cinema. So, narrative is a uh, kind of a confession, but is riddled with devious self justification and special pleading unreliable narrator. Now, this is a very good example of unreliable narrator. Again, we go back to uh, Kevin Spacey's character in The Usual Suspects. Now, the entire story is told to us in flashback by Kevin Spacey. At the end of the movie, when he walks off scot free, we realize that it indeed it, he was the killer. Okay. And we all get trapped by him because of so many things. Again, semiotics at work. He is a cripple, what could uh, he do? Okay, that is the idea. And then, he, when he walks away and walk, walks straight, we realize that we have been taken in. Okay, so, and can you think of more examples? Fight Club is a very good example. Fight Club. Is he an unreliable narrator or I felt it is a very strong example of homo diegetic narration. He cannot, he is a, he betrays his organization, that is another thing. He, he is not fooling the audience. The, the unreliable narrator fools the audience and sets up a certain kind of puzzles which the audience or the reader, readers are not able to decipher. Uh, perhaps Memento could be a good example of unreliable narrator. Yes. Six Sixth Sense. Sixth Sense. Excellent example, puzzle cinema and unreliable uh, narrator. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, Janet also talks about the concept of 
focalization and perspective, whose point of view, who, through whose perspective do we watch a movie. We have already seen characterization, we have already seen his concepts of time, okay, order, frequency, duration. Now, order of a narrative. Of course, the prime example is Pulp Fiction, but Memento is also another interesting take on how filmmakers play around with the concept of order. Okay. Anyone here who has not seen Memento? If you have not yet, please, I, mean, I, I know Christopher Nolan is a pattern here in, the, in this institute, but do watch Memento all over again. Okay. Now, uh, what does a character do? We have been talking about character and uh, American theoretician and novelist Henry James has written an, any number of articles and essays on how important character is. In fact, Henry, according to Henry James, character is much more important than the story, because plot is character, that is what he says and character is plot. So, how do we build up a character? How does a director build up a character? And uh, this is what Francois Joss has to say about uh, building up of a character. To distinguish between the relationship between how the camera shows the hero or the heroine and how the hero or the heroine is supposed to be seen, this is a build up that you give any director gives to a hero or a heroine, to a character, how he is supposed to be seen. When it sees things from the position of the character, this is his internal ocularization. So, concept of ocularization and focalization, they are very important in understanding narratives. When the opposite occurs, whereby it sees things from the position of some other person, it becomes external ocularization. Now, here we are asked to see things from the hero's point of view. I am very sure you know uh, what Die Hard is all about okay, and the still says it all. Okay. We are supposed to and what are we supposed to understand by this picture? Yeah, the camera is telling us to look at the hero from a certain perspective. What perspective is it? He, what is he wearing? What is his hair like? What is the look in his eye? What is he carrying with him? So, what kind of a hero is he? He is a one man army. Okay. He is a one man army and most heroes are supposed to be one man army. Um, otherwise, we have another plot like seven, where the villain is totally or completely in charge. Okay. So, again a movie like and this is just an example why Die Hard is such an interesting study of character. Plot too and it is a highly entertaining movie, but character, it plays on the idea of the lone ranger, all American hero. And that is what that still tells us, he is a lone hero. Okay, again. And no, no, I am not talking about a specific lone ranger, hero as a lone ranger, you know. Some, uh, for example, John Wayne, most of the time, you know, he may have a supporter, but it is not that important. After all, he is a one man army. Um, hero is basically a loner and the story unfolds through his point of view, his masculinity is, a, is always foregrounded. And if you look at this still, you will understand that he is an out and out macho, all powerful hero. So, it is not, yesterday we were talking about Kevin Spacey and his ambiguous masculinity, sexuality. I wanted to play husband, but could not. Here you have no such dilemmas. Okay, uh, let me take you back to Aristotle and his poetics, 4th century BC text, where he says that a plot or a narrative 
is a whole that has a beginning, um, middle and end. I am sure all of us here are familiar with this. Plot should have a beginning, middle and an end, right? And that is how all stories are constructed. Victor Shoklovsky in our test technique, a 1917 work, says that a story or a narrative can tell you about events in two different ways. One could be a very straightforward and a very literal representation for example, which is called in other words denotation or denotation a literal representation. To connote it as we have already seen is the symbolism attached to that, the symbolic representation of the same object. In a narrative according to Shklovsky, is the connotative code or element which is more important, because it gives a poetic color and it lends an imagination, a creative ima quality to the narrative. We are more interested in the symbolic representation of, so that is what he says and this is the concept that I have been talking about defamiliarization. The idea is where the ordinary is made extraordinary, not always by magical realism, a very popular literary technique especially by the Latin American writers. That we are not talking about magic happening here, ordinary becoming extraordinary, but it is the perspective that lends that touch, where ordinary is made to look extraordinary. The notion of seeing things through new eyes. So, we have a movie like Lost in Translation. Have you watched the movie? How many of you do not know Lost in Translation? Do not know? Please watch the movie. Bill Murray's directed by <laughs> Sofia Coppola, Francis Coppola's daughter. So, Lost in Translation, Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson. where an American comes to which country? Japan and looks at the new country through an entirely new perspective. Roman holiday, again the same story. How does the ordinary become extraordinary in Roman holiday? Audrey Hepburn, Gregory Peck. Tara, do you know the movie? Shweta, do you know the movie? How does ordinary become extraordinary? She is a princess who has been living in this ivory tower, that kind of a very protected life, always surrounded by bodyguards and her courtiers. One day she just decides to give herself a holiday and takes off. She is all um, by herself and here she meets Gregory Peck an American journalist living in Rome. She thinks that he is not aware of her identity, so she can play the normal girl. He knows who she really is, but he uh, goes along with her plans, however naive the scene. So, she looks at, so taking a scooter ride with the hero is an extraordinary event. Going to the barber and getting herself a new haircut is an extraordinary event, which for for any other person would not be. So, watch Roman Holiday, William Wyler is an important director for all of us, William Wyler's Roman Holiday. And the comedy in Marilyn Monroe and Laurence Olivier's The Prince and the Showgirl arises from the fact that she is a showgirl, okay, a very uh, beautiful, but um, a very commonplace girl, you know Marilyn would excel in playing such roles and how she behaves when she is, she comes in contact with 
um, someone, uh, uh, someone of royal descent as played by Laurence Olivier. So, everything becomes funny there, because she looks at um, the ways of uh, um, the court, the royalty through her perspective. So, that lends a touch of magic, something extraordinary happening there. Now, yeah, we come to Vladimir Propp and his morphology of the folk tale 1928 texts. And this is something again, which you should be interested in. This is, these are the characters he categorizes as you have a villain, every story has a villain. You have a helper, helper could be any helper, you know villains or heroines or the heroes, we are not interested, but there is always a helper, someone to assist, lone ranger has an assistant. A donor or a magician, someone who has a cap capacity, who has a capacity to change to, to bring magic to the proceedings, invariably a female in distress. A messenger or a dispatcher, you have a hero who is the real hero and you also have, a, occasionally you can also have a false hero, someone who everyone thinks could be a hero, but Finally, it turns out that he really was not uh, Batman, the Dark Knight. Okay, so, who is the hero and who is the false hero? Harley Dent. Harley Dent is the uh, false hero. Yes. And that point is made extremely clear by the end of the Dark Knight and the beginning of the Dark Knight Rises. This is another, uh, 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 the key, the most seminal work on, uh, you know, this is almost like a Bible of all screenwriters. Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces, 1949. Again, he draws on a lot from mythology and literature. And Campbell's book is divided into three key parts which uh, you can apply to some of the films you watch. And we try to do that all the time, every movie and we try to do this. The other day we were watching some of my scholars, a movie called Inception. Yeah? And we thought, uh, how does this fit in with the concept of Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces. So, um, three parts, departure, hero departs from his comfort zone. Okay? his initiation into the rituals, whatever those rituals might be. And he return, his return or perhaps he never returns, he is caught somewhere, but the end. Inception is not very clear about that. George Lucas in Star Wars takes Joseph Campbell's book as a template. And if you look at Star Wars, it has all the elements, it has all these elements which uh, you know you talk about or like the way prop describes hero, donor, dispatcher, magician, false hero, villain, helper, and damsel in distress. The Batman series is also about hero's departure, especially B Batman begins. Departure, initiation, and his return. The Lord of the Rings, of course, is a classic example and the matrix. I would uh, like to draw your attention to this movie and watch this and tell me how it uh, subscribe to the idea of hero's departure, initiation and this. So, we were talking about Vladimir Prop and morphology of folk tales. Do you think it satisfies, the movie satisfies some of the or all rather, all of the characteristics. Mention some, see this is the way you apply theories to cinema. So, when you watch a Lord of the Rings in future, please think of Vladimir Prop, please do not forget him. Please think of Joseph Campbell, okay, because you are doing this course, otherwise I would not make such demands on you. So, tell me.
Or who do you find by way of characterization? Come on, give me answers. Aragorn's character mm -hmm. that deals with his departure, initiation, and the return. No, you're talking about Vladimir Prop, right? Yeah. Yes. Departure, so initiation, return. Yes, okay. There is one element, but that's also in Frodo. That's also in Frodo. Okay. Whose journey is it? Frodo. Frodo's journey. Yes, the Lord of the Rings is an out and out Frodo's journey. Okay. Um, then what happens to Aragorn? What is? He's a very important, very charismatic character. I mean, it's Viggo Mortensen. It doesn't get better than that. Okay. So uh, we can't. We cannot just say dismiss him off. You cannot say that. Vigo Mortensen is not important, but he is a helper here. Okay, it's a very important character, an, an important heroic mature character. He is a helper here. Do you have a magician? You have, yes. Do you have a villain? We have, yeah. We also have an anti-hero kind of a character. Yeah, yes. Okay. So, Lord of the Rings is again uh, completely dependent on Joseph Campbell and Vladimir Propp's template. Absolutely. See, all these hero movies, all the, especially movies which deal with the journey of a hero and his spiritual awakening, his uh, salvation, life lessons learnt. Remember that sentence, you know, remember that term. Uh, life lessons learnt at the end of the journey. When it happens, it is always a Bildungsroma hero's journey, coming of age. Okay, so, something has been learnt. So, thank you very much. We will continue tomorrow.